You know, we came to Kiowa in 2000, and I don't really remember a major storm until 2015. And now it seems like every year we have a storm. So clearly, water management is something that is on the top of everyone's mind. And that it was highlighted in 2018 when the town came out with the sea, sea level rise report. And it really is an impressive document. They reached widely to get as much expertise as possible. And they picked a 30 to 50 year time frame, which is really how you have to look at kind of environmental issues. But about the same time, the Finance Committee was looking at the budget for 2019. And that we had already increased the uh, funding for our major repairs and replacements by a million dollars a year to cover repairs to underground piping. And we, we forecasted that that was going to last for the indefinite future. And at the same time, there was a capital project that came forward. And in that capital project, there were several hundred thousand dollars to deal with floods. And we said, we think it's time to take a step back, to take a look at a more comprehensive strategy for how to deal with flood mitigation. So we created the Flood Mitigation Task Force. That task force is made up of four community members, members of the Kika staff, and an outside engineering firm. When we came together, we said we have to add some kind of dimensions to the problem. The first one is the town had picked 30 to 50 years. But they also said that it's appropriate because there's so many variables in a forecast that goes out 30 to 50 years that you could have an adaptive strategy. And, <coughs> excuse me. And in that adaptive strategy, you can solve current problems and then measure with new data uh, how you might want to enhance those over time. The, uh, and so we said, instead of 30 to 50 years, let's try to pick five years. And maybe if we're lucky with the engineering solutions, we'll get more than that out of, out of that. But at least let's pick this five to maybe 10 year window to, to look at. The second thing is that there are kind of infinite numbers of possibilities you can look at in weather forecasting. And we didn't want this to be a forecasting problem. We wanted it to be an engineering problem. And so we said, let's define a problem that is clearly an inconvenience to the community, and let's solve it. And then we can pressure test that against other weather scenarios as, as we go. And so what we did, we went back and looked at different storms using NOAA data. And our worst annual storm is a, just about four inches a year. Uh, our worst storm in a year is about four inches. And that in that scenario, uh, the Kew Island Parkway, if it happens at high tide, the Kew Island Parkway has about 12 inches of water on it. And there's several communities with impassable roads. So that's clearly a problem. I want to talk for a minute about this map because this technology was developed by a professor at the College of Charleston who had a grad student who was mapping Q Island. And he mapped it down to a little bit less, a little bit more detailed than about one square meter and looked at how water moved in that one square meter. Now you can see from this map that there are several communities here that have impassable roads. And that, as I said before, Key Island Parkway has 12 inches of rain on it, or water on it. The, uh, if you go down Green Dolphin Way, the roads are impassable. Roads around the sanctuary, you can see in the dark colors, are also impassable. Uh, Mariner's Watch is completely closed down. And if you go north in the island, the settlement has got roads that are closed, and Rhett's Bluff has significant flooding on it. So, that's what we decided we would tackle from an engineering perspective. And the, we then moved into what's our approach? How do we look at it? Now, experts really have three levels of interventions in a flood scenario. The first level is to deal with drainage, get the water moving away, try to uh, create a, a, a situation where there is less pooling of water, less flooding, because of how fast the water can move away. The second is dealing with storage. So retain the water in some safe place and then let it drain over time after the storm passes. And the third are barriers. Now barriers are the most complex both environmentally and economically 
because they're in some ways a double-edged sword because they stop water from coming in, but they also stop water from draining away. And in essence, you create a bowl effect. And, and that's really problematic. And that's really where Charleston is right now, because they've built the barriers and they don't have the ability to create new drainage capabilities because of the development. So we are fortunate in that we have many options here that we can look at. The, this, and the strategy that we picked is very consistent with the Dutch dialogues. As I said, Charleston's in a different place, so they picked a different level of intervention than we picked, but because they, they're focusing on storage. But for us, drainage can make a significant difference, and that we're using the data from NOAA, and both in methods and data, and from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. So we really think that we have a state-of-the-art system that has also been adopted by Charleston, North Charleston, Beaufort, Folly Beach, and um, Mount Pleasant. The first thing to understand, though, is that we have a strong island drainage system here. However, we need to make some improvements and add infrastructure in order to optimize our current system. We're going to work primarily on the main arteries for the island. Keough Island Parkway and Governor's Drive in order to allow ingress and egress to the island, not only for our members and guests, but also for emergency vehicles. We're going to address areas that currently we have no detour, and we're going to address areas that flood today. If we think about it together, we all know those areas where we have no detour and they currently flood. Keough Island Parkway at the fire station. Keough Island Parkway at Green Dolphin Way, the V-Gate, Governor's Drive at Turtle Point Maintenance, and Governor's Drive just past First Flyaway at Trumpet Creeper Lane. So there are several ways within these projects that we're going to optimize our systems, and I'm going to share a few with you. We're going to add additional capacity. We're going to add new drainage pipe. We're going to clean out a tidal inlet to the Kiowa River so that drainage flows freely from the island in two areas, one on the parkway and one on Governor's Drive. We're going to lessen the frequency with which high tides can impact these areas of the roadway. We're going to raise 450 feet of the Kiowa Island Parkway, where it currently dips down into a bowl. By raising and leveling the road in this area, water will shed appropriately to the existing drainage system. We're going to reconfigure two smaller drainage areas so that they work more efficiently. We're going to provide a permanent pump to support the V-Gate intersection. If you were with us in the 2015 flood, you know how crippling it was to the island when the V-Gate flooded and took days to drain. This pump will allow us to keep this intersection open longer and or to drain it more quickly. One of the largest projects is to provide a secondary outlet for one of our large drainage basins on the island. The Beachwalker drainage basin currently drains almost the entire western half of Kiowa Island. The V-Gate and the Upper Parkway are at the very end of this drainage basin. For those areas to drain, everything to the west of them must drain first. Currently, the V-Gate is located approximately three miles from its drainage outlet. By providing a secondary outlet for the water, the V-Gate will only be a mile from its outlet. We're reducing the distance that water has to travel and providing a secondary outlet for this very large drainage basin. In doing this, we not only benefit the Kiowa Island Parkway from Night Heron to the V-Gate, but we also provide great benefit to south of the parkway and the neighborhoods that we're currently holding this water, waiting for both the western and eastern sections of the island to drain first. Now let's take a look at the before and after maps and the cumulative effect of these six projects on our island. It's important to note that these projects not only work for the scenario described, but also in both a 10-year and 25-year storm event. In the 10-year storm event, these maps change very little. 
in a 25-year storm event, the primary roads and arteries for the island remain open. Now it's important we talk about how do we fund this, because uh, although Kika does have reserves for major repairs and replacements, those are dedicated to our existing assets and that we don't have funds for new infrastructure to be put in place, as we're talking about in the project Shannon just discussed. That will require an assessment, which would be $130 per improved household over the next five years, or a total of $650. Now, it's important to note that any funding for this will go to water management. If there are any excess funds, it will say in the vote that they will have to be held for future water management projects. And that this cannot be extended or increased without another vote of the community. And that lastly, any debt that is created uh, through this will, will be repaid and not extended without, again, another vote of the community. Really, this project focuses on optimizing the system of drainage that we currently have in place. Um, flooding is a very unique issue. There's many factors that go into why it becomes a problem that we see on a monthly basis. Um, there's rainfall, tides, the groundwater surface and how it fluctuates with rainfall and tides, um, wind, and soil saturation. All of these factor into the flooding that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, and not one of these components can really be removed without affecting another. What that means is that we need to increase our monitoring efforts across the island as a whole. The town and conservancy have already started th this endeavor. The town has installed, a, will be installing a tide gauge very shortly, and the conservancy is monitoring groundwater levels across the island. Um, the next step is looking at weather and rainfall. How do we create a solution um, without having data to support it? it becomes a, differ, uh, a question that's a problem in the future. So with this baseline already done, we'll be able to look at this information, create predictions for the future, and then create solutions that manage adaptively. So this is part of a project that many entities on the island are working on. The town, the partners, the resort, and the Kiowa Conservancy all have roles to play in how we deal with uh, changing environmental conditions over time. And this is our effort to do our part, but all the other organizations are working with us and have supported these actions. So we hope you do too. <laughs>